that's doing the sweeping, and the total of all of that is not changing in time. That's the generalization, obviously, of the other one. Incidentally, the total of that is called the angular momentum, and this is called the law of conservation of angular momentum. Conservation just means that it doesn't change. Now, one of the consequences of this is, uh, just to show what it's good for, imagine a lot of stars falling together to form a nebula, a galaxy. As they come closer in, if they were very far out and moving slowly, so there was a little bit of area being generated, but on very long arms, uh, distances from the center. Then if the thing falls in, the distances to the center are shorter now, if all the stars are now close in, then these radii are smaller. And in order to sweep out the same area, they have to go a lot faster. So as the things come in, they swing, swirl around, and thus we can roughly understand the qualitative shape of the spiral nebulae. You can also understand in the same way, exactly the same way, the way a skater spins when you start with a leg out, uh, it's moving slowly, and as you pull the leg in, it spins faster because when the leg is out, it's contributing, when it's moving slowly, a certain amount of area per second, and then when it comes in to get the same area, you have to go around faster. But I didn't prove it for the skater. The skater uses muscle force. Gravity is, gra is a different force, yet it's true for the skater. Now we have a problem. We can deduce often from one part of physics, like the law of gravitation, a principle, which turns out to be much more valid than the derivation. This doesn't happen in mathematics, that the theorems come out in places where they're not supposed to be. <laughs> in other words, if we were to say that the postulates of physics were the law of gravitation, we could deduce the conservation of angular momentum, but only for gravitation. But we discover experimentally that the conservation of angular momentum is a much wider thing. Now, Newton had other pipe postulates by which he could get the more general conservation law of angular momentum, but Newtonian laws were wrong. There's no forces, it's all a lot of baloney, the particles don't have orbits, and so on. Yet, the analog, the exact transformation of this principle about the areas, the conservation of angular momentum is true with atomic motions in uh, quantum mechanics and is still, as far as we can tell today, exact. So we have these wide principles which sweep across all the different laws. And if one takes too seriously his derivations and feels that this is only valid because this is valid, you cannot understand the interconnections of the different branches of physics. Someday, when physics is complete, then maybe uh, with this kind of argument, we know all the laws, then we could start with some axioms and no doubt somebody will figure out a particular way of doing it. And then all the, dedu all the deductions will be made. But while we don't know all the laws, we can use some to make guesses at theorems which extend beyond the proof. So in order to understand the physics, one must always have a neat balance and contain in his head all of the various propositions and their interrelationships because the laws often extend beyond the range of their deductions. This will only have no importance when all the laws are known. Another thing that's interesting in the relation of mathematics to physics is this. A very strange thing that by mathematical arguments you can show that you can start from very many different apparent starting points and come to the same thing that's pretty clear if you have axioms you can use some of the theorems but actually in the physical laws are so delicately constructed that the statements of them have such qualitatively different character that is very interesting so if you'll permit me i'm going to state the law of gravitation in three different ways all of which are exactly equivalent, it turns out. But they sound completely different. One, there's the forces between the objects as described before, and each object, when it sees the force on it, accelerates or changes its motion right, uh, at a certain amount per second, uh, as I've described before. The regular way, I call it Newton's law. That is a completely different one. That law says that the force depends on something at a finite distance away. See, it has a, what we call non-local quality. The force on this depends on where that one is over there. Now, you may not like the idea of action at a distance, but it can know what's going on over there. So then there's another way of stating the laws, which are very strange, and it's called the field way of representing the laws, and it's so very hard to explain, but I just want to give you some rough idea of what it's like. And it says different things, completely different things. 
that there's a number at every point in space. I know it's a number. It's not a mechanism. It's the trouble with this whole physics that it must be mathematical. This way. There's a number at every point in space. Here's a number, here's a number, and so on. And the number's changing. It changes, rather, when you go from place to place. If an object is placed at one of these points, at somewhere in space, the force on it is in the direction in which that number, I'll call it the name it's given, called a potential, is in a direction in which that potential changes as quick as it can. And the force is proportional to how fast it changes as you move. That's one statement. That's not enough yet, because I have to tell you now how to determine how the potential varies. I could say the potential varies as one over the distance from each object. But that's back to the action at a distance idea. However, the force is at a distance. But you can state the law in another way. And it says the following. You don't have to know what's going on anywhere outside of a little ball. If you want to know what's, what the potential is here, you tell me what it is on the surface of any ball, no matter how small. You don't have to look outside. You just tell me what is in the neighborhood and how much mass there is in the ball. The rule is this, that the potential at the center is equal to the, poten the average of the potential on the little ball surface minus uh, this constant that's over there in the other equation divided by twice the radius of the ball. Let's suppose the radius of the ball is called A and then multiplied by the mass that's inside the ball if the ball is small enough. Now you see that this law is different than the other one because it only tells what happens at one point in terms of what happens very close by. Newton's laws tell what happened at one time in terms of what happens in multiple instance. It gives from instant to instant how to work it out. But in space, it leaps from place to place. But this thing is both local in time and also local in, in space because it depends only on what's in the neighborhood. And there's another way of representing. That's another way. Now, there's a completely different way. Let's see, there's a difference in the philosophy, in the... In the, in the qualitative ideas involved. You don't like action at a distance. You can get away without it. Now I'll show you one which is philosophically the exact opposite, in which there's no discussion at all about how the thing works its way from place to place, in which the whole thing is an overall statement as goes as follows. When you have other particles around and you want to know how this one moves from one place to another, you do it as follows. You calculate a certain quantity for, you invent a possible motion that gets from one given place to some other place that you're interested in in a given amount of time. Say it wants to go from here to here in an hour, and you want to know by what route it can get from there to there in an hour, by what curve. So what you do is you calculate a quantity guessing the curve. If you try this curve, you calculate a certain number for this quantity. I don't want to just say what the quantity is, but for those who have heard of these terms, this quantity on this route is the average of the difference between the kinetic and potential energy. Now, if you calculate this quantity for this root and for another root, you'll get, of course, different numbers for the answer. But there's one root which gives the least possible number for that. And that's the root that the particle takes. Now we're describing the actual motion, the ellipse, by saying something about the whole curve. We have lost the idea of causality, that the particle's here, it sees the pull, it moves to here, it pulls. Instead of that, in some grand fashion, it smells all the curves around here, all the possibilities, and uh, decides which one to take. But this is an example of the wide range of beautiful ways of describing nature, and that when people talk that nature must have causality, well, you could talk about it this way. Nature must be stated in terms of a minimum principle. Well, you can talk about it this way. Nature must have a local field. You, know, you can do that, and so on. And the question is, which one is, is right? Now, if these various alternatives are mathematically not exactly equivalent, and if for certain ones there will be different consequences than for others, then it's a very, that's perfectly all right then, because we have to only to do the experiments to find out which way nature actually chooses to do it. Mostly people come along and they argue philosophically they like this one better than that one, but we have learned from much experience that all intuitions about what nature's going to do philosophically fail. <laughs> it never works. One just has to work out all the possibilities and just try all the alternatives.